I'm Gloria Billy Ray, your host today. We're going to have a frank discussion with Nate Miley, Adam, Alameda County District 4 Supervisor. The interesting thing um, about uh, Mr. Miley is this man wears a lot of hats, but the thing that some of you may not know is some things that have happened that I think are just phenomenal. First of all, Mr. Miley was actually honored 25 years of service in January of this year. Now, something he doesn't even talk about, but I want to talk about it with him so that you can listen in. So we want to welcome a frank discussion with Nate Miley. Nate, thank you so much for coming in and hanging out with me. Thank you for having me back. This is my third time and it's been enjoyable. Yeah, well, that's why we call it a frank discussion because I love the fact that we're actually able to just have dialogue and again, I want our viewers to be able to get a sense of who their District 4 County Supervisor really is. Starting with, as I said, 25 years. In January of this year, you were actually honored for 25 years of service. And as the caption said, and, you, and you're still shining, you're still <laughs> moving, you're still going. And um, I'm honestly... The more I see you, I talk with you, you're like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> you just keep going and going and going. But let's just back it up and talk about 25 years of service. First of all, what, did, what does that even mean to you? Someone who came out here knocking on doors, mm -hmm. you know, just doing some grassroots types of things. And now here you are being honored in one of my most favorite and prestigious locations ever, the Claremont. Yeah, I, I felt very blessed to have been recognized and acknowledged for 25 years of public service. You know, I always aspired, or aspired for public office and mm -hmm. I achieved that, not recognizing that it would happen here in Oakland, California. I always thought I'd be an elected official and do public service back on the East Coast where I grew up and went to school. Mm -hmm. So having had an opportunity to serve as an elected official on the Oakland City Council and now as a county supervisor and, and be acknowledged for my work over those 25 years was, was quite touching. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I feel very blessed and I'm very, very thankful for having had the opportunity to serve. And I'm looking forward to another four years of uh, service as well to the uh, constituents of uh, my district and the people of Alameda County. Mm, absolutely. And um, I share with you, and for some of you viewers who may not follow me on Twitter, you should, but I want you to know that um, since we've had Nate on the show a couple of times, a lot of you have hit me up and said, I had no idea, didn't know that this is what my county supervisor did, wasn't even aware of all of the things that he's championed. And so I say to you, it's really important that you share this information with other people because you know what? Bad word of mouth, you guys know, will go so <laughs> far. But let's talk about some good things. We're going to get into some of those frank discussions with Nate, starting out with the housing crisis. Nate, in the news, we know that housing pretty much around the country, but centrally right here in our backyard, what's happening with the housing crisis? Well, we definitely are experiencing a housing crisis, not just in Oakland and Alameda County, but the entire Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's, um, I think, really prompting the crisis is the fact that, you know, we live between San Francisco, where it's like, you know, the Paris of the, right. of the West, and right. everybody wants to come to San Francisco, it's all of this and all of that, and then Silicon Valley, uh, which is high tech. And so that drives up the cost of housing in the entire Bay Area throughout the region. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a good thing that housing prices are going up and that we have a robust economy. The question is now, how do we address the need for more housing. Mm. And the housing we need to look for is housing for, for the homeless all the way up to moderate income. Mm. That's the yes. housing, the high end category of housing, let's say the million dollar plus housing, that's not an issue. It's an issue of how to get housing for the homeless, get them off the streets, get them into transitional housing and permanent housing, the very low, the low income, mm -hmm. housing for at-risk populations, uh, veterans, uh, the, ho um, um, 
um, uh, reentry populations, for example. That's and, huge. Yeah, and then housing for the moderate income population, uh, the working class population, our teachers, our firefighters, our retail workers, our nurses. Oh, wow. I mean, housing for them. So it spans a whole range of, 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 mm -hmm. of, of categories. So now how do we do that? So what the county's proposing, and there is no one panacea, but the point is there are things we need to do to try to address right. this. So what the county's looking at doing is putting on a $500 million bond measure. We're looking to put that on the ballot in November. Supervisor Carson and Chan are leading the effort for this bond measure. Right. I'm leading the outreach effort so that we can raise awareness, get the word out, and get people um, uh, um, educated about the crisis and the fact that the bond measure can help mm -hmm. with uh, help to address some aspects of the crisis. Mm -hmm. And so what um, this will do is it will provide money for housing in various categories from the homeless all the way up to the moderate income. Mm -hmm. What specifically has happened is when redevelopment was dissolved, right. you know, we used to have uh, money for uh, housing that was like 20% set aside for housing as, uh, through redevelopment. But when that went away, also went away a funding source for uh, housing, for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So we need to come up with a funding source for housing. And so the county has a housing trust fund, but there's very few dollars in it. So this uh, housing bond would help to put money into our housing trust fund. And what the county did is we used some of our redevelopment money, our former redevelopment money, we call that boomerang money, and we put it into housing, but still, you know, putting seven, eight, ten million dollars in it still isn't enough. So right. the housing, this housing bond will help um, uh, replace the loss of redevelopment. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the key will be, not because some people say, well, 500 million, right. that's not a lot of money. <laughs> but, if, you know, I've talked to some bankers and we're trying to talk to some more bankers, if we can get the banking community, particularly Freddie Mae and Fannie Mae, to maybe match us dollar for dollar for every, or for every dollar we put in, they put in two dollars, mm -hmm. this fund could be well over a billion dollars that we could have for housing in Alameda County. Mm -hmm. So then we're really talking s some significant money mm -hmm. that we can help nonprofit housing developers have a, um, a, a subsidies so they can build affordable housing and then also help the um, for-profit developers generate more housing. Because the, the issue is that there's a dearth of housing. There's a dearth of uh, housing um, production. We have a lot of demand, but the supply is not there. Mm -hmm. So we need to increase the supply in all these categories. Mm -hmm. One additional thing, or a few additional things, I should say. Okay. Um, with the, the homeless situation, the county is looking to put together uh, housing resource centers. And these resource centers we're hoping to have in all regions of the county so that if people are homeless, they can come to the resource center, they can get assessed, oh, we can wow. determine, you know, they can get an ID card, we can determine what their need is, why are you homeless, um, is it employment, is it mental health, what, what's going on, or you know, if you just choose to be homeless, then that, you, know, you make that decision. Mm -hmm. But maybe there are reasons that we can address uh, your housing situation and then help uh, assess that, address that, and get folks who are homeless into uh, transitional housing and then on the road to permanent housing. So the, the bond measure can only be used for capital, you know, for building things. But if we pass this bond measure, what we possibly could do is monies that, were, that are more flexible, Mm -hmm. We can take out of the capital category and put in the operational category into the service category, and that's how we can help the homeless with more services as well. So there's a lot of uh, things that's that this can generate. Parts yeah, exactly. That are, that's happening, especially when you talk about homeless, and a lot of it is mentally ill. Our mm -hmm. veterans. Mm -hmm. I, I I I have to tell you, my heart grows out to our veterans because I just feel that our country has not done mm -hmm. all that they could do, mm -hmm. should do, uh, and need to do as it relates to our mm -hmm. veterans. And when I see veterans who are fighting a war or wars, mm -hmm. you know, for us to have the freedoms that we have, and they can't even, they can't find an apartment yeah. to live in, um, decent housing. That, that just doesn't work, and so that would, you know, uh, definitely, and I, I think that viewers and people who are listening to this, they want to know more about that because, uh, you know, what do people say? Oh, another bond measure. Yeah, oh, right. you know, what's that going to do to my taxes? You know, how what's the bottom line to, mm. to them? 
Yeah. Um, at the same time, people are not in the situation. I, I would like to think the majority of people are not in the situation that they're in because they choose to, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but again, as you said, we're, we, we live in this wonderful area, but it's it's really the haves and the have-nots too. Yeah. And so um, knowing that there is a measure that's out there that you um, and, and the other, you know, county supervisors are looking to bring forward that's really going to have some mm behind it and start to see it. You know how sometimes things can um, be brought Mm -hmm. you know, to the public, but at the same time, it seems like it takes years sure. before the wheels start turning. And this is something in dire need right now. For it's sure. It's really something. For sure. And the, you know, the people can, can get engaged in this right now. Okay. Uh, what we're doing is the County Board of Supervisors, we're holding work sessions. And these work sessions, we've, we're holding six work sessions. Two have already taken place. Mm -hmm. And people can get involved in the work sessions and help shape the bond measure, help shape the priorities, uh, and, have a, and, and have input in, into this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm telling folks, if they aren't at the table, they're on the menu. So they need to be at the table talking about what right. they feel needs to be addressed. In fact, yesterday I was meeting with uh, an organization called Parent Voices, who work with um, child care, and they were talking about uh, mm -hmm. the issue of homelessness as it affects child care. And right. I was telling them, well, you need to get to the table and, and help shape this measure so that it can help address the concerns you have relative to child care mm -hmm. uh, and when it comes to housing. So in addition to the work sessions, we're having each supervisor will hold uh, a town hall meeting in his or her district. I'm going to hold two, in fact. Okay. In fact, I'm going to hold three. I'm holding one for the seniors, one in um, Ashland and Cherryland, and one in Oakland. And so uh, this is another way so that the public can come out and give us input on the bond measure, what they'd like to see, what they think are the needs and the concerns, mm -hmm. how they'd like to see the money carved up. Then in addition to town hall meetings, we're having stakeholder meetings uh, periodically where folks can get together too and talk about them, uh, how they'd like to see the measure okay. shaped. Then in addition to all of this, I'm conducting outreach, and outreach can take place through all of these mechanisms mm -hmm. too, the work sessions, right. the stakeholder groups, the town hall meetings, et cetera, but we're also doing outreach. I'm working with the faith-based community, I'm working with community-based organizations, I'm working with developers in the real estate community, mm -hmm. I'm also working with um, um, the CBO community as well. So working with all of these sectors so that we can get the word out to everybody that there is a housing crisis. The county's bond measure is not, once again, the panacea, but it can help. So understand we're, we're in a crisis in this county, in the whole region, and this, right. at least in this county, this might be a mechanism to help us uh, address some aspects of it. Okay. Now when it comes to the entire region, the county is also part of a, a nexus study for the entire region where we're looking at the nexus between jobs, housing, and transportation because we want to try to get people mm. living closer to where they work and that could help as well in terms of addressing the, the housing crisis, right. particularly if we have linkage fees and other types of, um, um, of, of, of fees uh, that would be uh, associated with housing and transportation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. jobs so that uh, p we can afford to try to build up like a transit oriented uh, um, development around where transit and right. uh, is and, and people and hubs are and people are, are working and commuting to Makes and sense. from. Yeah, so all of that's in the mix uh, in addition to everything else that I've kind of explained and talked about mm -hmm. um, to you presently. So mm -hmm. I would just encourage people if they're interested in the housing measure, if there's any aspect of this, to contact my office, 510-272-6694, okay. and, and, and let us know, and, and we'll, we'll plug you in, or, mm -hmm. or go to my, my Facebook, you know, just, just let us know, and we'll, we'll get you, we'll get okay. you dialed in, uh, because we need everybody in the county to uh, get, get on board with this. And the final piece is, the county has tried in the past to have, um, a bond measure, and no. it's failed. It okay. failed in 1988 and 1990, if my recollection is correct. Mm -hmm. And it failed, um, just barely failed, because we need two-thirds of the electorate mm -hmm. to approve this. And it'll be on the ballot in November. If it doesn't pass, then we, don't, we won't right. have the bond money. Right. Uh, the difference between 88 and 90 and now 
is in those years there was no housing crisis right. like there is right. now. So we're hoping this crisis and getting the awareness and the education out now will help us with the bond measure. And also we're going, to, we're going very methodically and carefully with this in terms of trying to prepare for the uh, ultimate uh, measure in terms of making sure that there's a lot of input from all the stakeholders, all the community before we actually put the measure on the ballot. And the board will put the measure on the ballot mm -hmm. uh, around the latter part of uh, July. And so that's kind of where we are, and I'm, and I'm glad you've given me the opportunity just to talk about all this. Yeah, it needs to. And, and in fact, as you were talking, one of the things, a question that I have, and, and probably some of our viewers too, is this. If you're looking to bring this particular bond measure, you know, to, um, you know, the voting public, then the question would be, is there, has there been any talk at all in terms of maybe doing um, a survey prior to mm -hmm. some type of survey or to, to, to get, because not everyone can get out to the meetings. And I want you to let people know if you know the dates already when uh, those meetings are going to take mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, one is now you're, you know, it's kind of like priming the pump a little bit. So if people are able to sit back and reflect and think about what this measure means and, you know, maybe a simple survey, why would you vote or why wouldn't you vote for? So you would probably know and the supervisors, county supervisors all know what it is that you're facing and what you're looking at. I'm just curious, or is that would be more money Mm -hmm. um, to be able to reach out to the voting public in that regard. Well, you're, you hit the, the, the nail on the head. We actually did a poll, okay. and the poll came back uh, favorable uh, that a bond measure would pass okay. uh, with 67% uh, of the vote in mm. the county. So before, okay. we, before we started down this path, we did a, a, a poll, and we found that to be the case. So now what we're doing it, and we're kind of calling this the, the, the period of pre-campaign uh, uh, because right. we haven't actually put a measure on the ballot yet. Okay. So right now what we're doing is exactly what you're saying, trying to educate people, mm -hmm. surveying people, getting mm -hmm. people engaged, getting the word out, mm -hmm. getting everyone poised for the bond measure to go on the ballot and hopefully it's, we'll put on the ballot something that we have consensus around right, right. so that when we put on the ballot in um, the end of July, the 1st of August, that's when we'll move into actual campaign mode okay. to try to get okay. it passed. So this phase is, you know, we did the poll, now we're in the phase of outreach, education, consensus building, mm -hmm. and then we'll get into the phase of actual campaigning. So we're right there where you're, what you're suggesting. Yeah. yeah and we are putting resources into uh, ha having to shape this and with all the, you know, like the town hall meetings, the work oh, sessions, okay. the stakeholder meetings, the outreach efforts, you know, that I'm kind of undertaking with the various sectors mm -hmm. of our society. So all of that is, um, we're utilizing county resources to try to make that happen in advance of the actual uh, measure going on the ballot. Because once we vote to put the measure on the ballot, then we, we, have, to back, we have to step back from using county right. resources and move into a campaign. Okay. Um, so the work sessions, I can just list the, the work sessions where I would encourage people to attend. Okay. And if they want to get involved in the stakeholder meetings, uh, town hall meetings and things like that, just please uh, contact my office. But the work sessions, work session number three, will take place on uh, April the April the 11th. Now, let me see here. That's next week, mm -hmm. April the 11th. And then work session number four will take place April 25th. Work session number five, May 16th. And work session number six will be June 6th. And the, 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 all the work sessions, except for the June 6th work session, are at 1221 Oak Street. Uh, okay. in the county um, building on the fifth floor in the Board of Supervisors um, conference room. And the, t the times vary from 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, uh, also in the morning at 9.30, and uh, yeah, and the, all the others are at 9.30. So I would, once again, just encourage people to contact my office okay. or go uh, or contact the, the Board of Supervisors office, because all of the supervisors know the, the work session schedules, right. and then just try to see how they want to get 
plugged in uh, and into this into this effort and they can yeah. decide if they want to come to the work sessions and if that's not convenient that's where we're going to have town hall meetings in our district so people can come and the town hall meetings will be in the evening okay. so convenient for folks except the uh, one of them I'm holding for the seniors will be during the day mm -hmm. and then um, and then stakeholder meetings some of those stakeholder meetings I believe will be in the evening as well mm -hmm. well I think that for the viewers who are tuned in one of the things that's important that that they recognize is this, and I'm gonna say it, people hear it all the time, but in order for you to have a stake and a say in it, you, like you said, you gotta be present, you gotta be at the table yeah. too. So to know that, because how many times have we heard um, things have passed and people say, how did that happen? Yeah. I'm against that. And yeah. then here, here comes, you know, uh, we're, we want to fight this. We want to recall this. This isn't yeah. what we want. And so um, you've really outlined it. You've told, uh, you know, all of our viewers what it is, uh, is going on, why they need to be present. I mean, present and accounted for, as they would say. And that means having a stake in what really happens. The other thing is, anyone that lives here in the Bay Area knows that the housing shortage is it's out of control. Yeah, yeah. It is truly out of control. And the thing that I would say when you say affordable housing, it really has to be affordable because the haves, they're not worried about, you know, for them, a million dollar home or two million dollar home, no big deal. But for a family who has a, a income of 40, 60,000, 80,000 even a year, and they can't even afford a yeah. one or two bedroom apartment, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. That's absolutely crazy. So people, you need to make sure that you are, you know, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. Exactly. I, I mean, that that's the reality. Exactly. So, um, and I can truly say that I, I know that your office is responsive because I've blown up Facebook about some things as it relates to my favorite mm -hmm. athletic team and, and your staff picked it up. Mm -hmm. And um, I was really surprised when it's like, would you like to meet? Mm -hmm with mm -hmm. with you know uh supervisor miley and they was like well yeah mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. and so what i what and why i'm saying this because i want people to know that you are open you are receptive and people can meet with you and so is your staff and yeah. that's really important yeah you know um i because of my community organizing background i try to make sure my office is open Ex, uh, um, accessible mm -hmm. and that my staff uh, deliver services and obviously nobody's perfect we of drop course. balls yeah. um, and we and th the, the one thing about the internet and social media you got a lot coming at you mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. it, it, but true. you still got you know correspondence coming in you still got um, face to face communications happening you still have the telephone so mm -hmm. it's not like <laughs> There's not a there's not a lot of communication right. uh, coming at us all the time. So we want to be as responsive as possible. And I would just ask people if for some reason we don't get back to you, uh, don't take that. Well, don't be slighted. Follow just up. just follow exactly. Just, just follow exactly. up. Exactly. I mean that that exactly. that right there is the is exactly. is the crux and the key thing. I want to go back to something also that um, you talked about, and this has always been really near and dear to my heart when you talk about affordable housing for. Um, you know, our police officers, mm -hmm. for our school teachers, for, you know, I think that that is something, when I find out that officers who protect us are driving an hour to two hours or better away in an outside community and commuting in, that's crazy to me. I do mm -hmm. believe that having um, the officers and people who live and work in the cities if they live there, it makes it just so much yeah. better. And I really, really hope that that will be the case. You know, our school teachers, I, you know, I always said they don't want me to run for president. Mm -hmm. they, because my thing is, look, the zero percent interest homes, um, you know, they would have really nice homes, be in the community. They... I mean, just make it so that people really feel like they really belong. And that's really what I hear you talk about. The two times that we've talked, that's one of the things that you've always talked about is the community, the, that whole piece. So I really hope that people will listen up, get involved, 
and really get out there and push, you know, push yeah. this through for sure. Yeah, if I could just kind of quote off of our um, sheet here, it says, sure. while, while Alameda County and the larger Bay Area region are experiencing economic and employment growth, wages and salary growth have not kept up mm -hmm. and residents cannot afford to buy or rent homes in their own communities. Right. Housing has become the biggest cost in a household budget. And so, I mean, I was at Axville Gospel Church this weekend for um, uh, talking about the housing crisis mm -hmm. to, um, at, both, at the 8 o'clock and the 11.30 service. Mm -hmm. And after one of the services, uh, one of the congregation members came up to me. Um, she's in her 50s and she's got a very good paying job. You know, she's one of these working class people. Mm -hmm. can't, can't afford, can't, can't afford, can't afford can't, a house. Can't afford to buy. And she right. was just very, um, let's say, upset of that she couldn't mm -hmm. afford to buy a house. Another guy's a teacher. He was talking to me um, after the service too. Can't afford to buy a house. So it's it's once again our housing bond's mm -hmm. not going to solve everything, but it can help along with other right. other um, let's say pieces of the pie that we can utilize to try to help address this crisis from tenant protections to trying to look at uh, how we can provide more um, more information around mediation services mm -hmm. between uh, uh, landlords and tenants things you know we just uh, how we can lift uh, you know right. all boats because I keep telling everybody it's a rising tide lifts all boats and we really shouldn't be looking at pe pitting landlords against tenants or right. developers against you know this the segment of our society everybody needs to embrace this and look at what we need to do is increase the housing mm -hmm. supply and then that's going to help all of us across all of these various spectrums and you know one thing you said and I feel very strongly about this you know we don't value teachers enough right I mean we value <laughs> and I have nothing against athletes right you know right. I have nothing against <laughs> they get paid you. a lot of money <laughs> right. but our teachers I mean other than my parents and maybe my minister, it was my teacher who influenced my life, mm -hmm. or my teachers who influenced my life mm -hmm. the most. And teachers need to be valued. They need to be compensated for that. I um, agree. And particularly if they're going to work in the inner city where it might be tougher duty, they need to be compensated better. And we need to attract good teachers to want to come to the inner city right. to work and uh, and provide that, that level of service. I agree. And I think that that can actually happen. Um, you're now talking about uh, starting this as a catalyst. You know, we need that snowball effect. And it is something that needs to happen because, as you know, with all of these people clustered together, um, we know that the crime, although for I can honestly say for us in, in the Oakland, Alameda County, you know, crime is not anywhere near where it used to be, mm -hmm. but we don't want it to escalate back to that. Mm -hmm. But um, when people have jobs, when people are working, I'm talking about real working, mm -hmm. I'm making some money working, mm -hmm. where they can afford to take their significant other out or their family out at least once a month. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and do something and know that it's not going to break the bank and I'll still have money to pay my rent, pay mm -hmm. my mortgage, mm -hmm. and afford a decent car. And, and we're talking about just basic necessities. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that you, you guys are looking at uh, having jobs. I mean, it's all encompassing mm -hmm. because guess what? If we're actually able to get around to our jobs much easier and faster, also, that means that more involvement because a lot of parents can't go to schools because they mm -hmm. they commute so far away. Yeah, right, right. They're not they're not able to be involved. And I mean, it's just really coming back to that grassroots effort of you know, it's not only no child left behind, it's no family left behind. Mm -hmm. It's really building a culture and a community where other states and cities will look to what it is that we're doing mm -hmm. here that's really going to impact and make the difference. Mm -hmm. I want young college students to come out who have the desire to buy a home, to be able to do it. They're making the money. Mm -hmm. They should. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. Nothing against athletes whatsoever. But I want them to always recognize, and some of them do, it's the teacher who influenced yeah. your life. Yeah, it's the teacher right. who taught you how to read and write, mm -hmm. you know, and understand. Uh, you know, math plays mm -hmm. a part in understanding mm -hmm. these plays and mm -hmm. all of these different mm -hmm. things. And I just don't think that they get enough credit at, at all. So I'm really, really happy to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. So 
transitioning from mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. um, since we're talking about athletes, <laughs> let's just, mm -hmm. you know, let's just throw in for our viewers mm -hmm. a little bit about something was happening, um, you know, I think pretty significant with the Oakland Raiders. And, um, you, you know, I, I mean, we've got the best I love living here in the Bay Area. We've got the A's, we have the Giants, we have the 49ers, we have the Oakland Raiders, we have Warriors, mm -hmm. go Dubs, by the way. <laughs> and um, it's, you know, San Jose Sharks. So we've got like this cornucopia mm -hmm. of sports teams that surround us and envelop us. But something um, happened with the Oakland Raiders. Can you Tell us a little bit about what's going on there. Sure. Uh, recently, I think about two weeks ago, the Joint Powers Authority for the Coliseum, uh, that's the governmental body made up of the city and the county okay. uh, that uh, deals with our sports teams. We approved a uh, license uh, extension with the Oakland Raiders uh, for another year with two additional uh, option years okay. and actually the the rent we increase the rent as well so not only we're we getting a little bit more money in return from the Raiders we've got them for another year and for uh, possible another two years so it's a three-year sort of deal mm -hmm. and I think that's that's good because um, what that does is it, it's an indication that the Raiders are still interested in being here in Oakland okay. it gives us more time to work with the Raiders on a stadium deal and it kind of just continues to help build the relationship and, and build that goodwill and also uh, recognize the, the, the compensation associated with the teams and the economic benefit associated mm -hmm. with the team, the team, the Raiders in, in this case, being here. Because, you know, a number of years ago we did a 10-year license extension with the Oakland A's. Right. So they're here as well. So, so it, gives us, it, it gives us some more time mm -hmm. to try to come up with a stadium deal uh, that involves uh, uh, both teams, I feel. Right. And, um, you know, there's still possibility that both teams could be, could be located on the existing property. And um, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, I'm still of the mindset, and um, I think I'm probably the, the only person uh, that has this mindset, even though I've, I keep floating it out there, that we work with the A's on building a new stadium. The A's can basically self-finance a new stadium, um, the Fisher family that owns the Gap, they've got the resources to finance the stadium and, and I think the public entities would, should work with them a little mm -hmm. bit on that and try to find a location and I know that's being done now, uh, possibly to either stay where they are in Oakland or, or look for a site in downtown or on the waterfront. So that's, that's, that's in the making, mm -hmm. but nothing definitive has come about just yet. Okay. And then with the Raiders, now the Raiders want a new stadium, mm -hmm. they want a billion dollar plus stadium. But I keep saying they don't need a, a billion dollar plus stadium. I really would like to just take the existing stadium and, and you know, there's some people that like the idea, some people that don't, but take the existing stadium and let's just retrofit it, mm -hmm. remodel it, and make it football only and let the Raiders play there. And that mm -hmm. could be the contribution of the public sector to the Oakland Raiders that, you know, you've got your own stadium to mm -hmm. play in. It's not a new stadium, but it's, it, it, it's worthy of the Oakland Raiders because the Oakland Raiders is a working class team. It, it, it identifies with Oakland, which is a working class city. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you don't, you know, the Raiders don't need a, you know, a, a Levi Stadium. What they need is a stadium <laughs> that depicts, you know, a working class, nitty gritty, uh, you know, a, a blue collar sort of community. And I think that's that's what I'm trying to pitch. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, then you know some <laughs> some of the people who are, who are die hard Raider fans are going to say, you know, now wait a minute. We we've, we've been waiting. The Raiders have been here for a long time. Cause I, I'm with you, by the way. I've been through the PSL, you mm -hmm. know, seating license and all of these things. They left, they came back, we still support. Um, but I think that when people hear the word retrofit, mm -hmm. they, they aren't aware that you're talking about bringing in an architect who will make that stadium you know, just as nice as, and there are actually other True. NFL stadiums that have been retrofitted, mm -hmm. look really, really mm -hmm. nice, mm -hmm. and they've just redesigned um, how the stadium looks, mm -hmm. and, and like you said, retrofitted, we do live in earthquake country, and we, mm -hmm. we need to take care of some of those things, so you could probably do that let's just say for half of a half of that billion dollars oh, for sure know, um, oh, yeah that you're 
you know, that the yeah. people are talking about proposing. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, that's the thing, the heart and soul of the Oakland Raiders is, you know, it's Oakland. I don't mm -hmm. care what anybody else says. And you're right. I mean, it's that nitty gritty, get down. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we've supported them all these years. So if that happens and if, you know, the powers to be are able to come together, uh, I think that would yeah. really be see, awesome. See, the Raiders want to have surface parking. Mark Davis is really mm -hmm. uh, big on the fan experience and mm -hmm. he doesn't want to have, you know, um, let's say um, double decker type parking or uh, so if we just keep the surface parking, we retrofit the existing facility, mm -hmm. I think we can market that. And that, once again, we're talking a few hundred million dollars right. as opposed to, let's say, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 $1 1 that might cost for a new stadium. Right, right. So we're talking a few hundred million, and that's not chump change, but we do that. And then we, we, we market the team as the team that, you know, is, is, is you know, your working class nitty gritty. You know, the, Raider, the Raiders are not the 49ers. The Raiders are not the Dallas Cowboys. Mm -hmm. You know, the Raiders are the Raiders. You know, the, you know, like the, you know, the, for lack of a better thing, you know, they take the, the rejects. They take the, you know, the outlaws. <laughs> they take the, the bad boys. Well, and, you know, they, they take, I, you I know. I think Reggie <laughs> would, would, would differ a little bit. His thing is, oh, we're changing the face of it. Well, and, and, and in that, in that regards, they, you know, the Raiders have had to rebuild. Um, and, um, you know, that's what they have been known for. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we're really working towards having a caliber playoff team. Oh, for sure. And uh, mm -hmm. the trades that have happened, mm -hmm. that is absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So I would be crushed. Mm -hmm. If the Raiders went anywhere else, I, I, I'm telling you, I'll probably be at Mark Davis' door mm -hmm. saying, I want a refund of all the years. Mm -hmm. And we're talking all the years that the Raiders have actually been in existence mm -hmm. of being mm -hmm. season two holders yeah. so uh, you know yeah well you know with mark i don't necessarily um, um disparage mr davis because mm -hmm. it is a it is a business it is, it is business. his team and, okay. and he's and, and it, he's got him you know he's got to look out for mm -hmm. the bottom line and and what make work makes the most sense for his franchise right and i'm just so in his efforts or his quest to kind of look at other places mm -hmm. i don't you know, i think that's that's appropriate but I'm, I'm just hoping that, and once again, my right. position is not the position that other elected officials and other people are taking. Right. My position is like a minority position. But if we can't produce this billion dollar plus right. facility for the Raiders, then what, what can we do that's going to be worthy of that team and is going to market that team and make that team, you know, once again, uh, the playoff caliber it, 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 it has been and it will be, mm -hmm. but in a stadium that's uh, worthy of them playing in. And, and obviously we need to have a stadium right. uh, that's worthy of them so they can attract uh, good players. And, the, course, and also the Raiders need to have the stability. They, uh, they need to have a home yes. and they need to know they're here. I think that helps with the fans. It helps with attracting uh, no quality question. players and no all that question. stuff. But if they're yeah. always, you know, Up where are we air. going and yeah. what's going to, it's like that, that instability is not good. I agree. And the other thing too, that we hadn't touched on for those fans out there who were saying, oh, you know, we have build this billion dollar stadium. Let me tell you, that means you got a billion dollar price ticket, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so for mm -hmm. those of you who are season ticket holders and, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of us, uh, mm -hmm. it, it won't come mm -hmm. without a hefty it price. Yeah, exactly. And that's what people are dealing mm -hmm. with at Levi Stadium mm -hmm. as well right now mm -hmm. and some of the other places. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I think that, like you said, it's, it's nothing to sneeze at when you're talking about, you know, retrofitting a stadium for several you know, million dollars, <laughs> and, and, and that's not one or two mm -hmm. million, but at the same time, what that looks like when it's going to affect my pocketbook, too. So um, I, I do think, and, and it's a beautiful place, you know, oh, Oakland for no. a long time have gotten such a bad rap, oh, yeah. but people, you know what? It's a beautiful city. I mean, we're so central to everything. Yes. The wine yes. country, yeah. the redwoods, yeah. yeah. the beaches, you name it. And it's mm -hmm. all right yeah. here. Yeah. Right. And so um, who wouldn't want to move here? Right. Yeah, you know, that's that's what I say. But um, I, I do think that people need to kind of look at the whole package. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things. So yeah. we'll keep our fingers yeah. crossed. And we'll keep the viewers updated in terms of where things are and what's going on. But I, I knew that that was in the news yeah. and for people who may be asking we definitely want to be able to talk about it yeah so let's yeah. transition okay. a little bit okay medical marijuana 
Oh, medical marijuana. Man, medical <laughs> marijuana. I mean, you got dispensaries <laughs> cropping up everywhere. Uh, you got people who are breaking in the houses. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm growing it, you know, <laughs> to be able to sell it. And, and, and so, you know what, first of all, let's just talk about um, uh, medical marijuana what your thoughts are about it. Uh, I'm really interested in, you know, it's always this whole thing about tax. It's not taxes, too much tax. So just, you know, let's just kind of talk about it from your perspective as a county supervisor and whatever it is you can tell the viewers about uh, what's going on. Okay. Well, let me just initially say uh, the passage of Proposition 215 uh, back in the like 95, 96, mm -hmm. established the whole medical marijuana um, effort. Okay. And it was at that point I became kind of a, 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 a champion, a proponent of medical marijuana. Because what happened is hmm. I supported 215, uh, but the reason I supported it is because people came to me, and, and often I get my best ideas from just the people I work with, the citizens, the population, okay. the community. So when you have um, people who are suffering medically, they came to me and they, and, and the, these people are genuinely suffering and they talked about how marijuana helped restore their appetite mm. or helped with their glaucoma or helped with them, you know, in some kind of way or another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To me, it's sort of like this drug does have medicinal uh, benefit. Right. So I became a very strong proponent of medical marijuana. And in fact, I led the effort when I was on the Oakland City Council to establish the entire framework from which the city of Oakland uh, has um, uh, gone about building its, uh, its, its dispensaries mm -hmm. and its efforts around medical marijuana. My staff worked with the uh, city administrator, the police department, uh, lawyers for uh, medical marijuana, uh, and, and others to try mm. to put all that underpinning together in the city of Oakland. So when I came to the Board of Supervisors, I did the same thing to try to establish dispensaries in the unincorporated community. And we have two dispensaries that have been operating in the unincorporated community basically without any um, problems. They're, they're regulated by the Sheriff's Department and our Public Health okay. Department and also our Code Enforcement Department also help to ensure that they're in compliance with uh, the standards of our, of our ordinance. Mm -hmm. And so they've been very good operators over the last, I'd say, 12 to 14, or, or yeah, 12 to 14 years since they've been in existence. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, in the unincorporated area. So now what the county's looking at doing is because the state has enacted um, uh, medical marijuana um, regulatory um, provisions in the state that allow for uh, medical di for dispensaries at a retail le level. They mm -hmm. allow for cultivation. They allow for manufacturing. So the state now is regulating the whole whole array of medical marijuana. Oh, wow. So what I'm trying wow. to do at the county now is upgrade our dispensary ordinance to have it come into compliance with what the state now allows and then also Makes begin sense. also begin to look at the whole efforts that, that the state now sanctions around cultivation and manufacturing mm -hmm. and other aspects of medical marijuana because um, with this if you think of medical um, um, of marijuana if you, if you put it in edibles, then it needs to be it needs to be kind of overseen mm -hmm. by our environmental mm -hmm. health department because right. you know that you know the people are eating it. If it's being grown, you need to make sure that our ag commissioner is kind of looking right. at uh, the pesticides and things that are being used for the growing of the uh, product. Mm -hmm. There's technology associated with it. The retail level, how is that being uh, regulated and administered uh, in our county? And, and the retail piece will probably be regulated and administered by each separate jurisdiction, the cities and okay. the county, depending on where it's located. But some other aspects of the industry are going to be regulated by, by the county because of that, that's the role of the county. Mm -hmm. Other pieces of it deal with um, um, the delivery because there are people that are delivering medical marijuana. And so how do we ensure the appropriate yeah. the appropriateness of the delivery mechanisms. So I, if, what I'm looking at is trying to tie in deliveries. To, uh, if you're going to deliver medical marijuana, mm -hmm. it's tied to a dispensary. You just can't open up your own delivery practice. It's got to be tied to, a, a, to an operator okay. as well. So, yeah. it, so we're looking at a lot of different aspects. So where we are in our effort is, I've got to, once again, 
stakeholders group. <laughs> like I said, I, 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 my, when, I was, when my kids were growing up, people asked, would ask them, what's your dad do? He goes to meetings, yeah. So I got yet another meeting, a stakeholders <laughs> group that, you know, at least 20 or more people, mm -hmm. att attorneys, advocates, others who are working with me on coming up with an appropriate uh, medical marijuana dispensary ordinance that aligns itself with the state um, regulations now. And mm -hmm. county council's beginning, beginning to look at that, and we're also going to be taking that to the Transportation and Planning Committee for the Board of Supervisors, which I sit on, to try to once again look at the whole array of what is now allowed and now how the county can begin to move mm -hmm. forward at the retail level, move forward at the cultivation and manufacturing level, look at the deliveries and look at all the various types that are now permissible under state regulation. Mm -hmm. And then we are looking at taxation, so we're bringing in the auditor's office too to kind of okay. uh, look at the whole taxing aspect of this. And we're, we're concerned about taxing because because uh, mar medical marijuana and marijuana in general is still a, um, a controlled substance under the feds, the IRS, you know, they don't allow for certain types of de deductions from the dispensaries or they don't allow for deductions at all. So there's a lot of overhead that the dispensaries have at the retail level that they aren't able to write off. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to impose taxes that are so onerous and burdensome on a dispensary that they can't operate because if they were able to write off a business ex legitimate business expense right. with the IRS, then then that write off, then maybe we could tax them at a higher level. But since they can't write certain things off, I want to make sure we impose a taxing mechanism, but maybe we don't, or we enact a, a taxing mechanism, but we don't we don't impose it. We don't say we're going to. Um, um, uh, levy a tax. Mm -hmm. We're going mm -hmm. to just enact and allow for us to do a tax and maybe as things change over time, maybe at that point then we'd look at actually yeah. levying a tax uh, on these uh, dispensaries. So that's kind of where I'm kind of moving this. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still a lot of moving parts and there's still a lot that needs to take place to try to get us uh, a new upgraded dispensary ordinance. My hope is that we'll be able to do that before the end of the summer and then after that move into the next phase of cultivation, manufacturing, and other aspects that are allowed under the under the state law. Mm -hmm. and then the other piece that would kind of uh, complicate all of this is you know there will be a ballot measure in the fall, a statewide ballot measure, to um, decide whether or not uh, marijuana should be allowed for recreational use. And if that happens, then that opens up a whole oh, so nother can of worms. Wow. A whole yeah. nother can of worms, yeah. Because yeah. uh, this is really, even the medical marijuana piece, it's really, really big mm -hmm. business. It's, and some of the dispensaries that have been operating are afraid that some of the you know, big guys are going to come in and want to take over. You know, Some mm -hmm. of the other industries that are more well-established mm -hmm. are going to mm -hmm. want to take over. So I'm also concerned about protecting our small, local emerging businesses. And the other piece of this, which I think our viewers and, and uh, you, Gloria, might find fascinating, is because our people, I'm talking about African Americans, mm -hmm. and also uh, Hispanics have disproportionately uh, been uh, incarcerated yes. because of mar yes. uh, marijuana, how, what social benefits, what social um, um, impacts are we going to put back into the mm. community to help address those, those needs that have caused us True. so much uh, injustice over time because we have been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So I want to build in with our ordinance and our efforts uh, also a social benefit type piece, a community benefit type piece that would help uh, re-entry populations, that would help, you know, uh, at-risk populations, you know, that would help, um, uh, you know, um, brown and black, um, it's mainly males that have suffered right. uh, incarceration right. as, a result, as a result of the drug war. I agree, yeah. I agree. Disproportionately, um, they have been sentenced and, you know, for an ounce of, mm -hmm. you know, having marijuana. And, and so um, th that will be really interesting. Now I'm gonna say is you talk about an undertaking, that's an undertaking. <laughs> and, and the man for the job, 25 plus years and still going, uh, you know, I think that that says a lot, but the viewers hearing this now, and, and, and I talk to people, you, you know, uh, some people are for, some people are not. Mm -hmm. Some people think that it's um, 
it's just going to, people going to run amok. Well, and, and quite frankly, we know uh, there needs to be tighter and stricter laws because there are some people who have medical marijuana cards and right. they're getting it and giving right. it and selling it to their friends and, uh, and, and those kinds of things. And so I'm certain that you, uh, you guys are also looking at all okay. of that because it's like with anything else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's something that people want, guess what? They're going to find okay. a way to get it. And so if that's the case, we need to be able to, whether it's, you know, some type, some form of taxation or stricter laws or those kinds of things. But um, if that's the case, and there's no question um, what people who have had medical conditions, oh, yeah. what marijuana has done for them. So, um, you know, it's, it's up and down, you know, from, from me as a nurse, I can see mm -hmm. both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, my thing with just, you know, the cautiousness around, you know, those people who just want to use it for recreational yeah. use, yeah. which a lot of them have been doing all of their yeah. lives anyway. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, I, I say that that's a lot, that that's yeah. an awful lot that you've yeah. taken on. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I'm, the thing is, we don't want youngsters to get med to get medical marijuana mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the 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 brain of a youngster before he or she gets to be 18 right. or so is still developing, I'm glad and, to hear you and, say that. and right. marijuana would mess that up. So we don't want that. But neither should we restrict medical marijuana for adults who need it. And we and like you said. Things are going to be abused. Right. Uh, prescription drugs are abused. Of course. Opioids, opioids are abused. Right. I mean, that's stuff I'm working on as well. But it doesn't mean we don't allow it to be used for people who legitimately right. have it. What we need to do, is, or or need it, what we need to do is try to see how we can build in um, the type of uh, regulations, the, the type of controls mm -hmm. to try to minimize as much of the abuse as possible without, you know, without. Um, uh, outlawing and having it go to the black market so that folks who need it then can't, can't get, get it. it. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, yeah. or or it's such a you know exorbitant fee or price that they have to pay, yeah. and is it really worth it? So um, I'll look forward to hearing more mm -hmm. as that kind of continues to take shape and form. Um, the last thing that uh, I want us to have this frank discussion about is um, twenty five years of service, Nate. You've been out there, you've been beating the bushes, pounding the pavements, um, you know, town hall meetings and, and all of these other things. If I were to ask you right now, what three or four things, if it's that many, you may only have one or two things that you just saying, you know, I'm just so passionate about it. And, you know, before I leave this earth, you know, take my last breath, uh, I want to see this done. What would this be? Well, I can give you, I can tick off at least five or six things. But let, me, <laughs> okay. let, me, let, let me let me start with okay. one, vulnerable populations. All right. And, uh, you know, we're talking reentry, youth, seniors, homeless, veterans. Mm -hmm. So let's just talk about seniors, trying to make sure that the senior population is growing, it has grown, and is expected to grow even more. Right. What are we doing to ensure that seniors can have a quality of life and can age successfully and gracefully? I know the county's looking at a comprehensive, integrated, uh, coordinated system of care in the county. There'll be a plan that, mm. you know, that um, uh, will be coming to the Board of Supervisors. I've been trying to um, help push this plan, and we should be looking at adopting it in, okay. in May. And, okay. it, and it's a comprehensive, coordinated plan. It's bigger uh, than anything we've considered in the, in the past. And then how do we sustain this and ensure that it stays uh, in terms of best, best practices and stays contemporary as mm -hmm. well? So, you know, vulnerable populations, seniors being one of those, but, you know, youth, also reentry populations, that kind of fits under those re categories. Is, is yeah. That, yeah. that right there, yeah. Nate, is um, actually I, I want to say, and I think that some of the viewers or a lot of our viewers would agree with me on this, people are afraid. They don't know what to expect when you say reentry. Mm -hmm. um, these are people who have been incarcerated. We know many of them. Um, they've been incarcerated and, and uh, it's not been, uh, the system hasn't been kind to sure, them. Sure. So now you're talking about people who they left, their world was one way, mm -hmm. 
and they've been inside. They've become institutionalized. Yeah. And now you're talking about bringing them back, yeah. putting them in these communities. A lot of family members don't want to accept them back. Sure, yeah. Um, finding a job. Uh, there are a lot of laws that have to, you know, be changed. Yeah. And although a lot of them says if it was a felony, you know, you have to disclose. Yeah. But when we talk about reentry, there are so many young men, and I'm speaking of more young black men yeah, sure. mm -hmm. who have, you know, actually have. Um, their families have moved on and they haven't. Mm -hmm. And so what does that look like? When you talk about re-entering re and back into the communities, uh, people are afraid. Yeah, They yeah. don't know what to expect. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's challenging and we're doing a lot on the re-entry front uh, okay. uh, in Alameda County, looking at services, uh, job development, uh, we're working on soft skills, working with the population when they're in in incarcerated at least in, in county jails and then working with them to continue uh, their development and their uh, re-entry into society when they leave incarceration uh, working on ho housing because that's another piece of the housing mm -hmm. issue and you know, right. I kind of mentioned that earlier on as well uh, so looking at it holistically uh, re-entry is, is, is definitely important and, and I'm going to say something on your show that I haven't said anything Ever so you're gonna you're gonna uh -oh. hear it for the first time. Okay. <laughs> Instead of reentry, I I want to start pushing pre-entry, pre-entry, and by that I'm talking about I prevention. Like that. Yes. Pre-entry prevention. Let's prevent this from happening, and and let's move in a direction like where we're doing more pre-entry as opposed to re-entry, so that we don't have to be facing this type right. of situation. Right. Now, once again, this is something that you're gonna turn around overnight, but let's start doing more pre-entry as opposed to re-entry. Okay. Let's get up the front end of this and let's kind of, like you're saying, change some of our laws, change some of our practices, same, change some of our attitudes and, and look at how we're going to prevent this. And okay. one way we prevent it, and I say I haven't, I haven't ticked off everything, uh, I've just hit on maybe two or three okay. things, is universal preschool. I think we need to have universal uh, preschool. No so we start working with our youngsters uh, when they're t three and four and get them ready yes. for school and get them on a path. Mm -hmm. uh, educate them, um, build their character, build their confidence. Uh, and I think all, everything associated with universal preschool helps around pre-entry. Right. It helps to kind of um, uh, get us the tone. out. Yeah. You're set, setting yeah. that tone. Exactly. That's what you and I came up with, with mm -hmm. you know, because actually it was preventative by talking about even when you were in kindergarten, what do you want to be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then following up and having those, you know, these different um, professionals come in. But I, I like that. I, I like yeah. that. Yeah. Pre-entry. Yeah. Pre-entry, universal preschool for yeah. everybody. Yes. Every youngster. Every youngster. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. You know what? Parents not just the wealthy. Come out. Yeah, not right. just the middle class. And, and, every and youngster. Every youngster should have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I agree with yeah. you. And once yeah. again, I mean, there's evil out there and there are fools out there. Of and, course. and I mean, we're in the world as it is, not as the world as it should be. So everything we do isn't guaranteeing that we're going to have the society that's going to be you know, kumbaya right. and, and, and all no, great, not even, but not even. there's a lot we can be doing that we aren't doing. And so that's kind of what I'm looking at, you know, once again, vulnerable populations, universal preschool, pre-entry, then there's the, the environment. Uh, one thing the county's working on uh, that I'm involved with is uh, uh, community green energy. We yes. call it community choice aggregation so that uh, people can start buying clean green energy as opposed to getting your energy from PG&E uh, you get get cheaper, cleaner energy mm -hmm. through uh, a mechanism that the county's putting together. It's already in place in Sonoma and Marin, and we've learned from what they've done, and we're trying to put this together in Alameda County. So the whole thing around the environment, I think, is a big ticket, too, because I just think, you know, with climate change, with, um, you know, trash and debris in our, in our uh, waterways, mm -hmm. with uh, cigarette butts, with, I mean, it, with, you know, it's just our society is just... Yeah. Um, is just is we're just ruining our our environment and our planet, and uh, we and we're beginning to feel some of the effects of that. But trust me, down the road, generations to come are going right. to feel much more of that effect. So once again, what are we doing 
we could call it prevention. Preventive. That's, that's right. That's helping to kind of turn yeah. that paradigm around. So that's another piece as well. So, but I can take off at least another yeah. three or four well, given time. Well, yeah. what, <laughs> what I'm going to say is um, this is a great, you know, uh, time for us to, you know, just to hold that thought because mm. having you come back to talk about that, I love that, you know, pre-entry, <laughs> preventative. I mean, that that's really resonated with mm -hmm. me. I want to, again, thank you for having a frank discussion <laughs> uh, with me and uh, talking about so many things to our viewers. I really hope that you're finding value in all of the things that your county supervisor is doing, especially if you're in District 4, but at the same time to recognize that the onus is on you. It's about you and what you do. So I'm going to ask that you tune in same time <laughs> next week, next month. We're going to continue these frank discussions with Alameda County District 4 Supervisor Nate Miley. I'm Lady G, your host. And I should say your hostess with the mostest because <laughs> Nate has brought some stuff to us today that uh, is going to give you uh, the opportunity to pause and think. So whatever you do, make sure that you do it well. Always do something good for someone else. And remember, when you do, you will be blessed. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Again, I'm Gloria Billy Ray. I'm your hostess. Real talk with Lady G. Until next time, be well and be blessed. Thank you. Groove it, people that know how to love one another.